everyone. This is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes. And this week, I'm going to be talking about red control in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, thanks to my newly discovered appreciation for Panicked Althasaur, a card which I've spoken moderately highly about in some decks, but that was purely from a theory and stats perspective. I've played the card a bit more now, and um, it's consistently impressed, and it's caused me to reevaluate how I feel about Red's ability to play in control decks in general. Before I get to that, as always, the notes are available to follow along at patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. And also, I need to speak to Drafting Archetypes' new official candle sponsor. Drafting Archetypes is sponsored by Mana Candle. You can find Mana Candle by searching Etsy or Amazon for MTG Mana Candle. If you are looking to have some more atmospheric home games of magic and maybe get some uh, candles of the colors of your favorite decks or whatever, uh, you can check them out. They have a candle for each color in magic, and they're all uh, handmade and lovingly shipped with lots of fun little bonus inserts, a nice card, uh, makes a good gift, and they even come in slash with dice bags. So feel free, they, they, the candles come in different sizes. Uh, you can um, choose the size of candle uh, with some consideration to the number of dice you have and the size of dice bag you would like to carry them in. I received uh, these candles from Mana Candle as part of the sponsorship, but I was uh, pretty impressed with just like the, you know, uh, neat care and packaging. So I think they'd make pretty good gifts and all that. Um, ordinarily, I don't handle ad reads on uh, this show. That's, uh, I, I just do the magic stuff. And then my business partner handles uh, everything else. But I did receive these, and I thought they were cool, so I figured I should speak to them myself. Now, uh, also, in full disclosure, I did just think it was hilarious. Um, shout out to my friends at System Magic that I have an official candle sponsor. Uh, if you know, you know. So, uh, moving on to the rest of the episode. As I was saying... Uh, until a few days ago, I preferred mostly to avoid red because I didn't really feel like it had a home in the control decks that I was drafting. Um, and I mostly was happy drafting kind of any color combination um, that didn't involve red because uh, I felt like I could build a re like cohesive control deck kind of anywhere. I guess not like green-white, but for the most part, there were like good sources of inevitability in other places, and I didn't really see how the red cards fit in. Then I played a deck with some Althasaurs, and they really just did everything I want to do in this format. Um, it shouldn't surprise me because of how much I've liked Hoverstone Pilgrim and Mineshaft Spider, both similar reach creatures, and I just generally feel like if you can have a good reach blocker, then it's pretty easy for uh, the board to stall out in this format, which is why uh, I feel like Hoverstone Pilgrim often kind of takes over in a way. Um, but Altasaur just wins the game while you're like spending mana on Hoverstone Pilgrim and kind of hoping to get through your entire deck to draw your good cards again. So that felt pretty good. I really just never ended up with Panicked Altasaur before because even when I realized that it like was better than um, cards like Onake Ogre, uh, which is the Panicked Altasaur equivalent in a previous set, except it was a 5-4 instead of a 4-5. Like, I noticed that it was a bit better than that, but I didn't realize how well it lined up in this format, and I was never willing to take it high enough to get it. Then I ended up with them, and then I was like, oh, cool, I'd like to play these more. But they keep not being in the packs as late as I'd like. I, th I feel like I was the last one to get the memo on Panic Altasaur, so if you already know all this, then 
by all means, uh, move on to your next podcast. But for me, I only realized this recently, and I've had to, I'm still in the process of figuring out how aggressively I need to take out the source to actually end up with them. Right now, I'm at the state where, like, I'd like to have them, but I keep not taking them, like, first to fourth pick and then not seeing them later. But uh, I do think once I figure out how high I need to take them to actually have them, that they uh, kind of meaningfully shift Red's role in the format, at least in terms of, like, what kinds of things I can try to do. So I want to speak to that um, both in terms of, like, generally how I draft red and then kind of also update uh, some things that I've said in previous episodes um, in light of uh, this consideration. So red's still pretty narrow in control decks, but it's not too bad. Like Panic Deltasaur and a Braid are very good. Seismic Monstrosaur, um, the land cycling 6-5 trample that can spend three mana to sack a land and draw a card, it's a pretty good control card. Uh, Volatile Wanderglyph works, like, it's just a flexible early card that works well with Craft and Descend and things that let you tap it, and it's just generally strong enough that I'm pretty happy with it in control decks. Uh, Plundering Pirate, the 3-2 that makes a treasure, uh, plays well when you're trying to splash or have more expensive plays. Um, I think it's, like, pretty bad, or at least unimpressive in aggressive decks, but, uh, a really nice piece for more controlling decks. Um, and then Rumbling Rock Slide is clunky, but playable removal. Um, that's the four mana sorcery that does damage equal to the number of lands to a creature. And then Sunfire Torch is not where I want to be in control decks because I typically want um, to be able to play a removal spell when I don't have a creature in play uh, or when I don't want to be attacking, which sometimes happens in control decks or often. However, I think that if you're specifically red-black with Death Touch creatures, or I guess even red-green with some frogs, then the ability to turn Sunfire Torch into like a hard removal spell is pretty nice. So it's like worth keeping an eye on, even though I think it's much better in aggressive decks for the most part. So th those are the cards that I'm looking for in red when I'm uh, drafting control decks. So as far as how that affects uh, other archetypes, it makes me reevaluate stuff I've said before. So red-white, when I talked about red-white previously, I talked about prioritizing cheap creatures and removal and mentioned that Altasaur played well in the game plan, which was uh, basically just to like win through reach um, and accepting that for the most part, your creatures are worse than theirs, but Altasaur like blocks well and contributes to your reach. Um, so pretty in line with what I was saying before with the minor like twist that Altasaur is like a better stabilizer and finisher than I'd realized in a way that makes me a little bit more comfortable uh, prioritizing removal a little bit more highly and shifting the deck slightly more controlling in the absence of high rarity cards. So rather than being like, I need rares to try to play a long game, I can be like, if I have Altasaurs, I can realistically play a long game. Not a major shift, but uh, just a spot where I might like be a little more comfortable uh, taking removal spells over moderate cheap creatures. Red blue. I don't think I've done an episode on red blue yet. I prefer the like inverted iceberg style of red blue over the Goblin Tomb Raider style of red blue, and Panic Deltasaur fits perfectly in uh, that more controlling red blue deck. This also made me wonder about a blue-red deck that leans a little bit more heavily on spells like Out of Air and Unlucky Drop and um, just like plays a high interactive spell count uh, with like Altasaurs and maybe some Icebergs and maybe doesn't necessarily try to like have all of the pirates and artifacts that you can for the like few uncommons that want that and instead is just like more of a kind of normal blue-red limited control deck. Red-black is the most significantly changed archetype. I'd previously seen, like, I didn't really understand what to do with red-black. I don't think the black cards are particularly good aggressive cards, and red didn't really seem to play a very good control role, and uh, none of the, like, cards that seemed like they were put in the set to support the archetype made any sense or did anything good. And... I think 
I've come to a new understanding of Red Black that feels right and good to me, which is that I now think of Red Black as having its closest analog being Orzov in Ravnica sets, where you have like a lot of removal and you're playing a defensive game and you're establishing some kind of persistent clock and just waiting for your opponent to die. And Panicked Altasaur, Tithing Blade, and Zayoa Lava Tongue, uh, the Red Black Uncommon, all contribute pretty well to uh, this kind of just like passively drain out your opponent strategy. You have like a little bit less life gain, but um, you're still like you have a lot of removal and you're very good at playing defense with your like, you know, 1 1 Death Touchers and your two mana, three, three lifelinks and your four or five reach creatures that deal two to your opponent to turn. So you get to just like not worry about how you're going to attack and just plan to like hang out until your opponent's dead. So that's like very different than what I think red black presents itself as in this set. But I think pretty easy to get together. Sunshot Militia is another card that can contribute here. It's worse than the others because it costs you a lot of defense potentially to be like tapping your permanence for damage on your turn. But the more you have like random objects collected um, that are not creatures, the more free that is. Um, so yeah, I, I think red black strength is uh, you just get a lot of removal, um, some decent defensive cards, and um, very persistent damage. In a way, you're kind of playing like red-white in this set, which is also about this kind of, like, you know, inexorable tide of, like, uh, reach damage, where, like, blocking generally works in this set, and uh, these decks can kind of subvert that by having damage that can't be blocked. So when you play against someone else who's trying to play a long game, instead of like getting to do whatever they're trying to do on the stalled board, they just die. So that's how I'm thinking about Red Black now. I think that early removal, uh, like Abrades and Tithing Blades and Deadweights are pretty important. I say that because my first experiment drafting this deck didn't have any of those and it had a lot of power but ended up being a little bit too clunky but the philosophy still felt right i just i played against very good decks that had good draws and my deck was a little clunky felt like if i had a little bit more removal with the same end game um it would be a lot easier uh like if you're not playing from the back foot then uh the drain is hard for your opponent to deal with so I'm a lot more optimistic about Red Black uh, with this like new Altasaur forward uh, burn strategy in mind. Um, and uh, then Red Green, basically no change. Uh, I'd already mentioned that Altasaur is very good in Red Green. Uh, it was a Red Green deck. Um, that got me into Althasaur. Uh, I opened Chimmel and then took some Poison Dart Frogs and red was the other color that made sense for my seat. And I didn't think that red green was optimal for Chimmel because um, I was thinking of red green as a little bit more aggressive, but I ended up with like three Althasaurs in that deck and the Althasaurs just like won every game and the Chimmel didn't matter so much. I mean, the Chimmel was good, but like really the Althasaurs were just the star of the deck. And um, it made it feel like, oh, the, like, you know, the, the red-green dinosaur stuff around them was whatever, but um, Altasaur just worked so well that it could play with kind of whatever. Um, and so since then, I've been, like, on a mission to try to find more opportunities to play Altasaur. So I talked about how it fits into the two-color decks. I'm also interested in it. Uh, as a splash in green black I, i've typically been expecting to splash blue in my green black descend decks if i'm splashing 
I would certainly try to avoid splashing red because I didn't feel like there was much that I wanted. But I think Altasaur, um, you know, fills that Mineshaft Spider, Hoverstone, Pilgrim role that I'm usually looking for in those decks in a way that's sometimes, I think, even better. So looking forward to experimenting more with like Red, Black, and Jund with Altasaur. I haven't quite gotten to like do everything I want to do with it yet. I have a pretty clear vision of how I expect it to go. Um, and I suppose on that note, also this was the week that I had to do it. Ravnica Remastered is coming on to Magic Online this weekend. Uh, so I expect to have a chance to play with it finally. And I think that I'm going to do an episode on Ravnica Remastered next week. The last thing that I wanted to kind of compare this to is I think that it's interesting that like during Wilds of Eldraine, I did an episode about red attrition decks that focused really on a single red common, in that case, Grabby Giant. And um, there's some parallel here, right? Where there's kind of a single red common that is a reach creature that kind of by itself flips, lifts up red control decks. And I think Grabby Giant and Altasaur are meaningfully different. I think that both of them want to play in a game where tempo stops being what the game is about. With Grabby Giant, you want to pair it with removal to slow the game down so that Grabby Giant can generate card advantage and grind the opponent out in a true attrition game. With Altasaur, you don't need as much removal because you're expecting Altasaur to provide virtual card advantage by being a powerful blocker that shuts down all of your oppo opponent's attacking creatures. And then rather than making trades to grind your opponent out with card advantage, you're just trying to get a bunch of virtual card advantage that locks up the game and inevitability from the reach ability. So the nature of like how the cards play and what kind of support they want and how they like impact the game is a bit different, but both cards do something very different than what most of the other red cards are doing in a way that like opens red to a different strategy than it otherwise has access to. And I think that's kind of neat. So that's really what I have to say. Mostly just, hey, Altasaur is good. The fact that it's good is a little bit different than the rest of what Red's doing. And here's how it affects the decks that we're aware of. So yeah, pretty simple, but the kind of update that I think is like sort of interesting in terms of how uh, understanding of a format sh can shift later in the format, um, where like understanding just a single common can kind of have these cascading effects. So um, yeah, gonna wrap up my uh, rant here and turn it over to chat for any questions you have. As always, I'd like to remind everyone to check out patreon.com slash drafting archetypes if you are looking to uh, support the program. No new sponsors this week to shout out, but uh, appreciate all of my listeners and current patrons. And let's get to questions. What do you have for me, chat? Surprised you only recently noticed what a good wall Althasaur is with your volume of games. Is that because you're often drafting slower decks so you never experienced its strengths against flyers, small do uh, dorks, beat down firsthand? I think Althasaur has been decent against me. I think that I've like lost some games to it. But I guess I often have answers to it or some way to go bigger than it's going and while i kind of respected it like you you feel a card a lot more playing with it than playing against it and like i said i think that the issue is that i kind of respected it but not quite enough and i didn't realize like how high other people were taking it and so you know there are some cards where it's like yeah i would play this if it ended up ended up in my pool but it never does because I just value it like a few picks lower than the community. 
So, I mean, as far as like <laughs> misinterpreting your question is like, you fool, how could you have missed this? I would say that, uh, you know, a thing that I often say about kind of everyone's progress in Limited is everyone's kind of working from their own local maxima. Uh, like you figure out kind of the stuff that you like and understand and then you kind of evolve from there. Um, and so you have the understanding that you have and you can usually move, you know, one step this direction or one step that direction. And so you figure out like, okay, I went a step this way and things got worse. So let's go a step the other way. Things got better. Okay, let's keep going that way. And, you know, the, the chart of like what's good, there are like different nodes of success. Uh, I guess that 17 Lands has done some stuff in that space in terms of like graphing clusters of cards that do well. Um, and it's hard to find like a successful node that's very far from what you've been doing or involves prioritizing cards really differently than you've been prioritizing. And so I guess it's just really hard uh, for any drafter not to have some blind spots. Which mana candle scent is most likely to improve your dating success? I'd say that's probably a matter of what color the person you're trying to date likes to play. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I am not currently attempting to function as a, an expert relationship advice, though, as a warning. I've been quick to fire off removal when playing aggro in this format. Should I be saving relevant removal for Altasaurs if the opponent is red and seems controlling? So a lot of the like red removal can't kill an Altasaur. Uh, if you are, you know, a deck that would lose to an Altasaur and you have like a big removal spell, um, you probably don't want to like burn it too aggressively unless it's like clear that you're creating a path where you can like win through your opponent's attempt to stabilize. So like in general, with hard removal, like with, you know, little cheap removal that you're playing as a tempo play, like use it the way that you intended to get your damage in. But if you have a finite amount of versatile removal and you're in a spot where if your opponent plays like a powerful creature in the next few turns and you've used your last removal spell and you would lose that creature, you should probably hold on to the removal spell. Uh, this is very, very, very context dependent. Do I think red black descend slash pilgrim decks can be viable with Altasaur anchoring the defense? Yes, except that I think that you want Altasaur mostly in place of rather than supplementing pilgrim because the pilgrim is unnecessary when you have Altasaur going. And so like I would rather like if I could have N pilgrims and or n altasaurs and a pilgrim or just n plus one altasaurs i think i would rather always rather have n plus one altasaurs in my red black deck and yeah i guess that's all i have to say about that if you didn't have any altasaurs would hunter's blowgun for the reach mode plus backside of tithing blade act as um as a proxy work could this mean orzov style decks exist outside of red i mean if the question is can you drain people out with good defense and tithing blade? Yes. Um, it's certainly quite a bit slower uh, when you're not like combining it with more of those effects, especially the effects that are doing two or three damage turn instead of one damage turn. As far as using blowgun for reach, I've been happy with that as a sideboard plan, less happy with it, less interested in it as a main deck plan. I think that Blowgun is worth thinking about for reach in best of three, but I'd be hesitant to try to like draft around that even in conjunction with Tithing Blade in best of one. You mentioned splashing Altasaur. What sorts of fixing are you looking for to do so? Just card draw? No, I mean like Sunbird Standard and Frog and um, Caves are generally the ways that I splash things, and that would still be true here. Um, I'd say, like, probably not card draw in Jund, um, but uh, I could see using the three-mana instant that looks at four and puts a creature and land from among them in your hand as a way to, like, dig for a missing color. 
and also just like you know get your like card advantage and make your land drops to cast your altasaurs on time and stuff but mostly captivating caves and promising veins and uh altasaur and sunbird standard especially when you're you know if you're possibly splashing multiple colors and then treasure of course um though in that space it would be more like red green splash black or red black splash green since the treasure is usually gonna usually slash more or less exclusively gonna come from red all right seems like questions are slowing down so i'm going to wrap it up here uh thanks everyone for listening as i mentioned awkwardly somewhere in the middle of this episode um i am intending to uh cover ravnica remastered next week i suspect that i will just be doing one episode on it uh to be determined depending on uh i guess whether i end up like really liking the set or something like that but apologies for not being able to get it out before the first week of events with it but um i think that there are a number of i've heard of uh some rcqs that will be using the format and stuff like that so um i will be attempting to play with the format enough to get a feel of it and talk about it next week so um for those of you who are interested in that or uh tired of lost caverns Ixalan, uh be sure to uh tune in next week to hear about uh ravnica and um that's it for now. Have a good week, everyone, and I'll see you then. Bye. Prepare for light speed.